Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education, part six, and this is session one. And now what we're going to do is we're going to move from justice to the introduction now to the next godly decision-making skill of judgment. We put these up on the board. You, you, you already know what they are, but now look, I'm going to tie some things together here. So this is not review for the sake of just marking time. I'm going to show you some things that I didn't do when we went through this. And so, and equity, of course, is a fourth one, but we'll cover it when we get over there. I, I gave you the attributes as we begin to come down through wisdom. I gave you the attributes of godly love, and we notice those. But I didn't do it for every single one of those divisions that we made in the, in the passages of Scripture. And so I want to do that now. So here we are in Romans, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You realize that was a sonship checkpoint before you get in. But you know what? I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know what? That because, and remember, I told you this was, the, this was the relationship to your father and his business. In other words, if you were going to engage in this education and be equipped to labor with him, you were going to be called upon to do a couple of things in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And the first thing is to present your body a living sacrifice, Right? And you understand what happens when you give something as a sacrifice. There are things that you are going to happen to you physically that we talked about this at the end of the last session, that only the grace of God is going to be sufficient to enable you to endure those things. So you're going, first thing you're going to have to do is present your body a living sacrifice. The second thing you're going to have to do is what? Just think about the verses. What's the second thing? It's in verse 2. He tells you what not to do and be not conformed to this world. But what's the second thing you're called to do? Transformed how? Thank you. And that's what the doctrine is going to do. It's going to renew our mind and it's going to, and when it renews our mind, it's going to transform us. And, it, and that transformation conforms us to the image of God's Son, right? So that we think this is issues of God in us. We think like God. We live like God. We labor with Him in what He's doing. So this relationship to the Father's business, right off the bat in Romans 12, 1 and 2, here's what I believe it's doing. I believe that it is asking us to make a commitment. And by the way, if you ever talk to anybody that talks about relationships, one of the first things you realize is that a relationship requires commitment. commitment. And I don't know why I didn't talk about that when we were back there, but it should have because your father is saying, I need to know that you mean business here. I need to know that there's a commitment that you're going to make to this. And would you say that commitment is an attribute of love? Well, I sure would. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, that's when you, when you get ready to start a family and you walk down the aisle and you get married. You know what you're doing? You're making a public commitment. Okay. Okay, so all right. I think everybody gets that. And so... By doing that, by presenting our body a living sacrifice and being transformed by the renewing of our mind, we're going to be able to put on display or we're going to be able to prove the will of our Father. In other words, it's going to be manifest in our life every day as we make decisions out of His wisdom. All right? So that brings us to the next part. And that is Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. And uh, that is the relationship to ourself. Because we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But we're to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I gave you a godly attribute for that. Because you found out in these verses, it's not all about you, but you are part of a body. And you need that body. That this is not Lone Ranger doctrine. When someone says, I don't need everybody else, I'm going to go out and be a son on myself. That, that's hard. This not, in fact, it's not made to do that. Just like, remember he gave you the analogy, there are many members in one body, and the eye can't say to the hand, because you're not the eye, you're not of the body. You need every part to do what you're doing. You need eyes doing their job, ears doing their job, hands doing their job, feet doing their job. All the body works together. And, if the whole, and remember, he comes back and he says, if the whole body was an eye, how would you hear? You, every member of the body is dependent upon the other members. Yes? All right, so when you get that going, you realize this is not about me. I'm not thinking of myself more highly than I ought to think. So here's the relationship, the relationship to self. And so there was a godly attribute of love. Thank you, Ron. Selflessness. 
Now, this is important. We're going to spend some time on this, and, and I've, I've got to keep going so we can get this. The next one was Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 16. And in this, what we had was the relationship, the relationship to the saints. Not to the body as a whole. We got that in the previous section. But now... We have a relationship to the saints and how we're supposed to treat each other. And, we talk, and it talks about in honor preferring one another. And that the, 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 the edification of the other saints is supposed to come ahead of your own edification. That you really are committed to each other and you treat each other just that way. And when we went through that doctrine, we got, we got an uh, a attribute of love that I gave you out of that. Does anybody remember what that is? Loving kindness. Remember? And we talked about that word kind, and it has that root of kin, which is the love that you have for family. In other words, that's how we're supposed to be feeling about each other with this. And so then we moved on to Romans chapter 12, and that's going to be verses 17 to 21. And that was the relationship that we have to our enemies. And we found out about what it meant to heap coals of fire on their head. That it was meant to soften their thinking and change them. It was the goodness of God that was going to lead them to repentance that has caused us that if our enemy hunger, we do what? We feed him. Because we're looking for a way more important than for us to see them suffering for what they did to us is what our Father is trying to do with them in this dispensation of grace, which is a dispensation of long-suffering and forbearance and goodness, right? I mean, we pulled that right out of the book of Romans. And so this relationship to our enemies, and so as we were going, going through this, I did not give you an attribute of godly love when we got to that. But I'm going to give you two of them now. One of them is, I think, very easy, and that is long-suffering, because that's what your heavenly Father is being. He's being long-suffering right now. And that means He wasn't imputing our sins to us and judging us when we were lost. He was allowing His goodness to bring us to Him. And if we're going to be His sons, guess what? We're going to do the exact same thing. Instead of looking at retaliation, we're going to be looking at the goodness of God bringing them to repentance. But remember, we talked about this in a context. That didn't mean that you don't have the right to go to the justice system to recover damages for things that are done. It's not talking about somebody rams you on the road and you go, no, you know what, never mind. You know, I just, the Bible tells me I'm going to have to pay for this myself. No, that's not what the Bible's talking about there. And we, we discussed all that, so I'm going to go back through it. But I'm going to give you another word because I'm going to give you some definitions here in just a moment. It's not in the text, but a lot of these words are not in the text. The word selflessness is not in the text, but that's what's being spoken about when it says a man ought not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Those things are all there. But look, here's the next word, and I really debated about giving you this word because I wasn't sure that this was the place that it needed to be, but I, th I think it is, and that is meekness. And I want you to see this. Uh, I've got a quote here by Charles Smith uh, on, on meekness. Oh, look, I forgot that was on the deal. Thank you, Trent. Meekness. Now, look at this. There are some words that sound very similar, but they're different, and he's going to point out this difference first. Meekness differs from mildness, gentleness, and softness in being never applied like them to deportment. You know what your deportment is? It's your behavior. Those are words that describe behavior, but meekness is applied only to temper or character. Now look what he says here. It is a theological virtue, but with the world at large, it is not in favor. Now he's going to explain why. When has been imposed upon it the idea of excessive submissiveness. That's the way we have been taught to view meekness. And isn't it funny? Back in the 1800s, that idea was already being imposed upon that word to such an extent that Charles Smith wants to correct that idea as he's defining the word meekness. He said it is not excessive submissiveness. Now he's going to give you the next one. Meekness results from the absence of, er the absence of arrogant self-will or self-assertion. Look at this. It is the quality which meets not violence with violence or force with force or clamor 
with clamor. Does that ring a bell with you? Recompense to no man evil for evil. That's right in that passage. So meekness fits perfectly with that. And then look what it says here. But it endures. Isn't it funny, these word choices he's making? But endures provocation and submits to wrong. But not just for the sake of being meek, for the sake of your father accomplishing something here. Remember? It's not just, well, I just, I'm just supposed to go around being meek. Your, your father is having you submit to the wrong that is being done to you by your enemies because he desires to do a work in them that will change them from no longer being your enemy but maybe to being your brother. And that's got to be of more importance than seeing them suffer for what they've done because it's more important to your father. Okay, so Romans chapter 12, verse 17 is the verse I quoted to you. Recompense to no man, no, no man, evil for evil. And that's just what... So I've used these two words of long-suffering and meekness. And... Uh, uh, I, I'm going to come back through these, but I have one more to give you. And that's the one we just finished. And that's Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And that was our relationship to government. All right? But I didn't give you an attribute of godly love to go along with that. Now, I have to be honest. I, I thought about this, and I debated this, and I thought about this. And I started to call John, but you know how much help he was last time. So I didn't do that. And I started to call Loopy, but, you know, okay. But you know what I did? I, I, I just went over this and I went over this. And, and uh, look, let me, I'm, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus here. People get to do it the way they do it. And if you disagree with something I've got up here, okay, that's your prerogative. You're a son. I'm not your tutor and governor. That being said, the way this normally gets taught is that I'm talking about in sonship circles, the way this normally gets taught is that it is the job of government to have benev benevolent goodness. And so that's the attribute of love. And they're saying, so we're supposed to have benevolent goodness. Well, I have to tell you, I have a problem with that. I'll tell you what my problem is. This is not about how we perceive government feeling about us. This is while we feel about government. And by the way, just because government is supposed to have benevolent goodness, and so that, therefore we are too, we don't emulate government. We emulate our Father. So I have problems with that. So I'm going to erase that because that's not it. This is about our response to government. And you know what? We've been, we've been told some things there about what to do. So here's the word that I chose. You won't like it, and I'll go ahead and tell you that later someone will come up with a word, and it'll be a better word, and I will begin to use that. And depending on if they're present, whether I give them credit for it or not. But... <laughs> I'll use the, I'm sure there's a better word, but let me defend this word when I put it up here. And the word is propriety. Now, let me just show you something here. Give me this next slide here. There's propriety, and now give me the next one because I got, in my way of thinking, here's how I'm using it. Propriety is conduct befitting the situation or circumstance. That is what propriety is. Now, I know that's me, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you the Oxford English Dictionary of Propriety. So here it is. Fitness, appropriateness, aptitude, suitability, appropriateness to the circumstances or conditions. That's what I wrote, isn't it? Appropriateness to the circumstances and conditions. Look at this. I highlighted this part because I've already told you that part. Conformity with the requirement, rule, or principle. You know what we talked about good was? Obeying the law. Conformity to the rule of law. So when I talked about propriety, I'm not talking, here's what I'm saying. That we have a proper way to conduct ourselves and that thing ought to be appropriately in line with what... Well, I actually have a sentence here, so let me just read the sentence because I really like the way I said that. In this case, it is conformity to our behavior with the ordinance of God. 
We're conforming to the ordinance of God. That's what he created it to be. So in my mind, it was propriety. In other words, proper conduct and behavior in accordance with the situation or circumstance. Um, now, we're going to sum these up, so I think we've got a deal here coming up. Committed. And, and, let me, and by the way, this is the reason I'm giving these to you again, because I got to thinking when I got these words up there, I thought, if I'm right, because remember, Romans is kind of the outline, right? It's the introduction. We're going to get the meat on the bones in Corinthians. And I thought, hey, if I got these words right, I should be able to find them in the, in, over in Corinthians. And I thought, oh, I'm glad I'm figuring this out before I go teach it. Okay, so I go over to Corinthians, and here's what I find. Committed, I have verses 1 and 2 down for that, because in Corinthians, if I don't have charity, I'm nothing. I think love starts with commitment. I, if you, by the way, and, and so I'm, I'm going to read all the verse. I'm just putting it up there. When we make a commitment to our Father, we're committing to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and that means that we'll take on what He loves or what he values and esteems, for the reasons that he values and esteems it. Okay, the next one was charity. I, I'm sorry, charity. I'm sorry. The next one is selflessness, and I've got it right up here. The next one is selflessness. So here's the next one. Verse 5, charity seeketh not her own. I thought, okay, that works. All right, so the next one is uh, loving kindness. And what do you have in verse 4? Charity is kind. And that's exactly what we were talking about, all right? The next one is long-suffering and meekness. Well, let's take long-suffering. Verse 4 says, charity suffereth long. Well, you can't get much closer than that, can you? And if you're going to talk about meekness, look at verses 5 and 7. Verse 5 is not easily provoked. And how about verse 7? Endureth all things. And I thought, there you go. So we got both of those down there. Now, the next one is propriety. Proper behavior. And here's what verse 5 says. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly. Dodged a bullet. <laughs> you know, and, I, and again, there's probably a better word. But look, that, that is the issue sitting over there in Corinthians. So... Uh, we value and esteem the ordinance of God, which leads us to be subject to lead a quiet and peaceable life. Okay, so we went through all those so that we could see all of that. And so now we want to read this first. All I'm doing is I'm setting you up to get into what we're about to have. You may say, oh, that was a, that's a neat little review. It's not just a review because now what we're about to get in Romans chapter 13 and verses 8 through 10 is we're about to get a post doctrinal exhortation that takes us back to all of this. He's going to go back and he's going to talk about this and we're supposed to think about it. Not only that, I also believe tucked away in those verses is the pre-doctrinal exhortation for what's about to follow in the next section, which is going to be Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. And so let's take a look at this just to kind of read through this. Romans 13, 8. Now, just look what he says all of a sudden, because if you've been looking at this, you're saying, I know you're talking about the attributes of God and love, but I really don't see all that over there. When Paul gets to Romans 8, he writes this, O man, O no man anything but to love one another. This whole passage is about this. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, look what he says in verse 9. For this... Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, we're going to talk about why he says it that way. He's not saying, eh, I'm not really sure if there is any more, but if there is, he's not saying that. He said, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find the word neighbor according to the way the Bible uses it. Because the neighbor is not just the person who happens to live next door to you. They are a neighbor, but that's not the way the Bible is using this. By the way, I've seen guys take this and they go, okay, so i got to do this to the guy that lives next door, but I don't have to do it to anybody else. 
I have seen that. And I think, okay, never mind what I think. Okay, verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. There it is again. And we're only going to have to define neighbor. We're going to have to define what it means to work no ill. What is he talking about there? Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Do you know what he's doing? Is He's coming back, and he's taking everything that we've gotten so far, and he is saying, by the way, why, and we're going to answer the question, why is he even bringing up the law here? Why is he talking about that? We are going to address that as we get into the details of this, but let me just kind of give you a little bit of a, pull the curtain back a little bit. There are always people who are so opposed to grace because they believe that grace allows you to just go wild and do whatever you want to do. And what Paul is showing them is that the godly love under grace fulfills everything that the law intended to do. Let me ask you a question. Was there anything wrong with the law It's in and of itself? No, it was the righteousness of God. The problem was man can't keep it. He can't justify himself with it, and he can't sanctify himself with it. And so Paul is saying, you know what, you, you can try to keep the law and you're going to fail, or you know what, you can, by the grace of God, be transformed, and everything that was contained in that law is going to be fulfilled. Wow. How good is that? So you're not, you're not taking a back seat to the law of obeyer. You're way out ahead of that. Okay, but we have more to say about that, and we will when we when we uh, get over there. Now, this whole section, as I've already shown you here, is actually divided into two parts. Verses 8 to 10 is one part, and then it's going to shift gears in verse 11 and through verse 14. It's got, and that's the way I see it, and I think if you read that whole passage, that'll become very evident to you. And we'll, again, we'll kind of look at that when we get over there. Um, what I'm about to do now is I'm about to give you a list. And oh boy, do I hate to do this. Because any time you see a list, there is a tendency for many people to take that list and set it up like a law and think, now if I just obey the list, I've got it. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm just going to give you some examples of how these things look. Now, all of the, look, there's a lot of things that we learned back here that wasn't just stark raving new to you. But now what you have to start doing is taking these, these things because these first two areas are really connected, wisdom and justice. They're black and white. They're, they're, they're pretty clear cut. Yes, there are complex issues with regard to them, but for the most part, things are laid out. When you get to judgment and equity... Things are not laid out. There's nowhere you can go to find the rules to say, this is what you do here, and that is what you do there. There's none of that. You're going to have to start thinking about this now out of your sonship life. And the only foundation you're going to have is the one that was laid for you up here. So what I want to do is I want to show you the ways. I'm not, I, I'm not going to show you every way. I'm going to start out a little more detailed, and when we get to the end, it's going to be very brief. We're just going to get briefer and briefer as we go. But I want to show you the ways in which you can take this and start utilizing it in your every day life as a sonship skill by asking yourself some questions with regard to this. So Trent, let's put this first one up. It, and this is the first one that we're doing this in, in this area of commitment. Is the decision I'm about to make going to negatively impact my commitment to my father? Someone give me an example of a decision that you could make that would negatively impact the commitment that your father wants you to make. I, I need to know you understand, huh? Breaking the law. Murder. Oh, oh, okay, murder. <laughs> murder would do it. And, and breaking the law. But let's, let, okay, that's one way. What's another thing? Think of something more. I, I just, I'm trying to branch this out into other areas. What's a, what is a decision that a person could make that would negatively impact the commitment Okay. Okay. No, no, that's fine. I was hoping somebody would say this. I'll just quit. Yeah. I'll just. 
there you go. Right, right. It would be like, you know what, I can, I can do the Bible study work or I can get season tickets at the Rangers and I'm booked on Tuesday. I'm not, see, do you see how close to Tudor and Governor this is? I'm not trying to say that. And by the way, you'll never be an example in a sermon if you get Rangers tickets. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to, you know, put you around the world as the Judas that you are. I'm not going to, I'm not <laughs> kidding. I'm not going to do that. And so this is, this is why I reluctantly do this. So that's pointing this out. But you understand, there are decisions you can make that will negatively impact this commitment. And you, everybody mentioned a way to do that, and I'm really glad you're thinking in other areas because we've got about three different areas there. The next one is, is the decision I'm about to make in line with presenting my body a living sacrifice? Now, how would that not be? Oh, God, I don't understand. I don't understand why you're not healing me. I mean, you know, hey, I'm just so sick and tired of it. I thought you were presenting your body a living sacrifice. Here, here's patient endurance. Here's the next one. Does a decision I'm about to make reflect the renewed thinking that I have been taught? It is really easy to learn something, but if it's not in you yet, to forget about it. I want to take the propriety issue. When my kids were little, I decided I was going to teach them propriety. They were too little to pronounce the word right. But I was going to teach them some things. So I taught them when they were growing up, you say yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. You answer the phone. You said McDaniel residence, Tracy speaking, or whoever it was. And then I taught them. I said, and you guys, you need to learn to give your seat to a lady. And so I had them practice, and I set them on the sofa in the living room, and I had Tracy come in, and then and I, tra and I taught them to stand up and go, take my seat, please, you know, and then they just stood there and gawked at her, you know, and I, so I'm trying to teach them all this stuff, and I'm saying, you, you know, I'm teaching you how to have some manners and how to have some propriety, and so when their mom came home from a Bible study, and, you know, they were all geared up, you know, when she came in, you know, then Mike Jr. jumps up, and he goes, take my seat, please, and she sat down and said, oh, that's so nice, and we had also, I need to tell you, this, been working on pulling out the chair for a lady, you know, pulling out the chair for the lady. And so she goes, this is so sweet. I think you boys deserve ice cream. Yay! They ran straight in, climbed up in their chair, and grabbed spoons, and were just waiting. <laughs> Propriety lesson absolutely forgotten. So it's easy to forget, you know. So I'm asking us to reflect, is this really the renewed thinking that is supposed to be in me. Just because you heard me say it on Tuesday doesn't mean it's effectually working yet. Okay, here's the next one. Is the decision I'm about to make going to help or hinder me in participating in my father's business? And that's a good question because there's a lot of different ways to answer that. Here's the next one. Is the decision I'm about to make proving the will of my father? Or to say it another way, in what way am I putting his will on display? I'm just trying to give you a way to take these things in this first set and, and begin making decisions with this in mind, okay? Here's the next one. And you see we've moved now to the next section. Is the decision I'm about to make, is this decision selfless? And that's an easy question to ask. Here's the next one. Is this decision for my benefit or the benefit of the body? Now, I'm saying that in the context of this. But let me ask you a question. Is it possible to make a decision about something that makes your life a little easier and it's okay? Yeah. Well, sure it is. Sure it is. But you understand that there is a core question that you're answering here about what you're doing and why you're doing it. It's okay for you to find some comfort or make a decision that makes things a little easier for you, but not to the detriment of the body. Everybody understand? Okay, so here's the next one. Does this decision reflect that I am part of a body? Because I have to tell you, if one, you know, I, I illustrated this wrong in Monahan's, and I had to correct myself. Give me the next one, Trent, and I'll do them both together. Does it result in my participating in this body? Give me the next one. Is it in cooperation with the other members of the body? You know what I've done? I listed those first two body attributes. Remember? Participation, cooperation, 
Somebody tell me you remember the third one. I made flashcards and handed them out. Okay, excuse me while I commit suicide. Okay. <laughs> the third one was respond, serve. Thank you. Respond and serve. Okay. So I just took those first two as all I did, and I put them out there. Now, does it result in my participating with this body? What if your foot decides, I'm not participating? I'm going to get up and go get some breakfast, and your foot goes, I ain't going. I'm not walking, not supporting any. And you know how far you're going to get? Not very far, at least not easily, because one member decides not to participate with the body. Is it in cooperation with the other members? What if your foot is saying, oh yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something, but this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing right now. This is what I'm doing. Well, I need to go get something to eat. Yeah, well, I'm doing this. Don't tell me I'm not participating. I'm busier than all of you. But you see, he's not cooperating with the rest of the body. So it takes all of that. Uh, here's the next one. Um, does my decision serve the other members of the body. That's the third component. Here's the, here's the next one. Am I responding to situations of the other members of the body? And that's how we're supposed to look out for each other. We're supposed, and when one member suffers, what? All members suffer. And when one member is honored, we all what? We're jealous. I'm not jealous, sorry. We're, we rejoice. <laughs> so here's the next one. By the way, we've changed now to this one, loving kindness. Does this decision exhibit loving kindness? And you know what? As easy as that sounds, that won't always be easy to do because we're used to making decisions like this without really thinking about these kinds of things. That's why I gave them to you in a list in your notes for you to look over, not to make a rule or a law out of, but to remind you, these are the things I have to be talking to myself about. I have to be asking myself about. The next one, is this decision motivated by the brotherly love that I have for someone? The next one, is this decision promoting my fellow saints and honor preferring one another? I just took the stuff right out of the verses. Here's the next one. Does this decision reflect any slothfulness on my part to engage in my father's business? You, you know where that came from, don't you? Not slothful in business. This is really easy. I mean, preaching's easy. You just read the verses and put stuff up, and people think you're smart. Okay. Here's the next one. Is this decision being made with godly enthusiasm? That comes out of fervent in spirit, remember? Or am I being reluctant? <sighs> Fine. Fine. Remember how when your kids used to fight with each other and you say, you're going to apologize to each other. And here's what they did. Sorry. And you knew it was heartfelt. Your father's looking at this and he's saying, hey, have a little godly enthusiasm for what you're involved in here. Don't act like I'm having to drag you kicking and screaming because he's not dragging us anywhere, right? All right, just posing the question. Here's the next one. Does this decision engage me in serving the Lord? I just took that next phrase as all I did. And by the way, there's a half a dozen ways to ask every one of these questions, okay? Uh, the next one. Does it reflect that I am rejoicing in hope? Maybe we'll talk about that again sometime. Here's the next one. Does it reflect my patience in tribulation or my impatience? Here's the next one. Does this decision stem from what I have been praying about? Ron said a while ago, oh, I see somebody in need. Loopy is starving to death. You know what? Something happened. He's not getting paid. He's not getting any money. He's starving to death. Ron and Linda know about it, and Ron and Linda go, oh, dear God, please put bountiful plenty on Loopy's table. Amen. Hey, hon, you want to go out to eat? But if you're going to be, have, uh, this is going to be a, a matter of sonship prayer, what are Ron and Linda now going to be thinking about? What are we going to do about that, right? And so, is this a decision that stems from what I've been praying about? Because if you've been praying about it, you just signed up to get involved in it, all right? Does this decision help or encourage those who are not as far along as me? Where in the world did you get that? Condescend to men of low estate. There are folks that are not as far along as you are. You could sit up there on a, 
on a perch and look down and act like, well, bless your heart, you're just not very far. Or, you know what, you can get right down where they are and you can help them with what you do know. And I, everybody understands that. Here's the next one. Does this decision provide things honest in the sight of all men? And I started to talk about this, and I thought, you know what? I don't know how many people even remember what that was about, so I'm going to make you go back to your notes and look at it. We're not going to talk about it at all. Here's the next one. Does this, because we've changed again, does this decision reflect that I am being long-suffering? Here's the next one. Am I forgoing justice in order to accomplish something of greater value than seeing my offender punished? I mean, here's the next one. Am I taking advantage of opportunities to heap coals of fire on the head of my offender? If you don't know what that is, that really looks like we're bad, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm taking advantage. I let the air out of his tires the other day. Okay, that's not what that is. Does this decision reflect that I am being overcome of evil? And, of course, here's the last one. Does this decision reflect that I am overcoming evil with good? Those are right out of the passage. And now we come to the last one, which is this, this propriety issue. Does this decision reflect that I understand God's purpose behind government? The second one, am I looking at government for reasons other than my father's? And the last one in this one, are my actions those defined as good or evil? There's a lot more qu You can tell I got less and less as we went, and I only got three on the end because I think by now you get the idea. But I wanted us to be able to look at this and say, I actually do have some tools right now that I can begin using in the decisions that I'm making every day. And instead of just making the decision I want, now I'm thinking about making a decision in line with proving my Father's will to manifest the, the whole uh, concept that I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind, that I really am functioning like a son is supposed to function. And so you can add to this list, and, and you can talk about it, and I hope that you will. I hope you won't just look at that and go, okay, well, that's done. We'll move on. But we are going to move on. We are going to look at some other things here in the few minutes we've got left. So... Let's see. I, I, I need to catch up because I did not follow this in my notes, so let me catch up to where we are. So this brings us to the last part of what I wanted to talk about today. I told you that justice and judgment are different. Justice is God's norms and standards for what is right and what is wrong, or what is good and what is evil. When you get to judgment, now you're not looking at anything in which there is an objective standard of what is good and what is evil. You're now faced with maybe multiple decisions of things, and none of them are bad. But what you are going to be called on to do is discern which among those decisions is a good decision. You'll also be concerned with what is maybe a better decision. And in order to make that determination, you're going to have to know why. It's a better decision. And then you may say, you know what, out of those choices, this is the best decision. And you're going to be called on to actually determine, to, to be able to, um, to determine between what they all may be good decisions, what is the best one. Now, I'm going to put someone in a scenario. Let's suppose, well, I picked on Loopy, so I'll pick on Loopy again. I can't pick on Loopy because he's not... Okay, I'll do it like that. I'll pick on Ron and Linda. This will be good because Ron deserves this. Let's suppose... No, I can't do it with Ron. He owns the business. Um, no. I'll do it with John. No, I can't do it with John either. Okay, Fooey. We don't have anybody that fits the bill here. Um... Fine. Loopy. We'll do Loopy. We'll go back to Loopy. Sorry. I spent two minutes there wandering around the room. I should have just stuck with Loopy. <laughs> Loopy comes in one day, and he calls up John, his buddy, and he says, man, I'm forced with a real dilemma. And John says, what is it? And Loopy says, there's going to be, ma oh, I can do Teresa and James. No, I'll do this. Okay. He says, we're going to be faced with massive layoffs out at the workplace. And what they did is they called everybody in, and they said, if you will voluntarily quit, 
we will give you your salary for the next four months and we will pay for your insurance for a year. And that gives you time to find a job and have an income and still have insurance for a year. If you decide not to voluntarily quit and you are one of the people that goes, you will get two weeks severance and no insurance. Or you could take your chances and be one of those that keeps their job. And Loopy says to John, what do you think I should do? Now, none of those decisions are evil, are they? If he decides, hey, you know what, I'm going to stay and I think I can keep my job, I'm going to stay. That's not an evil decision. But it's not an evil decision for Loopy to go, you know what, I know they're downsizing and I don't know how many people, I'm going to go ahead and take four months of income and a year's insurance and I'm going to go find some work somewhere else. Is that an evil decision? Of course not. This is the difference between judgment and justice. And now you're going to be called on to discern between those kinds of things. Now, you understand that as you learn these principles, and that's what these are going to be, this is not going to be a list of, if this situation occurs, here's what you do. Because everybody's situation is different. Let's suppose Loopy stays and Teresa stays. But Teresa keeps her job and Loopy gets laid off. Different outcome, right? So there's no set answer, and that's what I'm trying to say. There is no set answer for the judgment. And so there's all, and, and, and there's all kinds of examples, but people wonder these kinds of decisions all the time. You say, well, you made an extreme example. I'll give you some that you hear all the time. I wonder where God wants me to go to college. I wonder who I'm supposed to marry. I wonder which job I'm supposed to take. What does God want me to do with my life? Where should he live? Where, where should I live? Those are quite, look, the guy called me up the other day and he said, hey, got this little deal going at church and they um, want me to write a paper about what I think God wants me to do with my life. And I'm supposed to read it. And he said, here's what I'm thinking. And he tells me what he's thinking. And I, I'm thinking... I know what this paper is asking. What does God, what do I think God wants me to do with my life? What does God want me to do with my life? And that's going to be, I think God wants me to be a missionary and he wants me to go to Portugal and he wants to, those are the kinds of things they're asking for. But your Bible doesn't say any of those kinds of things. Those are sonship decisions. What you're going to do about that is going to be your decision. By the way, you know what? It's a judgment decision. And until you know the principles of judgment, you won't know all the information that you need to know. So here's what I, I gave him three things, and I said, hey, I, I'll give you three things that I think God w wants to do. But what he wants to do, I, they're all found in the Word, and um, they're true for every saint not just you. It's not an individualized thing. It's true for everyone. I said, I think God wants you to make known the manifold wisdom of God, the principalities and powers in heavenly places. I think he wants you to be conformed to the image of his son. And I think he wants godly edification to take place in your inner man. And you know what? If you get those right, the answers to the other questions don't matter near as much. Because the spiritual things that God wants to do with you are far more important than the other things. I, I don't know how that went out yet. I haven't, I didn't get a call back yet. I think he's recovering in the hospital. But anyway, <laughs> this, this idea, and, and you know what, we have all these strange ideas. You know what? And I heard a guy preach on this when I was a young preacher, and I thought, wow, he finds all these verses. That is so neat. How does he do that? And I got discouraged, Tommy, because I thought, I'll never be able to find this stuff. Man, how does he find this stuff? Because when I was a young preacher, listen, I was ignorant with a capital I. I don't know it all now, but I know enough now to understand just about how ignorant I was back then. And I'm not saying ignorant in a derogatory sense. It's what I didn't know. That's what ignorance is. And so I heard this. Let me put it up there, Revelation 3. Because you know what? God is the God of the open door. And if he opens a door, he means for you to go through it. 
What? No, no, back me up. Revelation 3, I'm going to read it. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. A guy is preaching at a church and he's saying, you know, a, a, a pulpit committee comes and they sit in and they say, we're looking for a pastor and you know what, we're thinking, you know, you might be the guy. We're going to go back and report to the church and we want you to consider coming to be our pastor. And you know what he's praying? We're just going to see if God shuts the door. Right? I did that my whole life. We'll see if God shuts the door. So you know what? They go back and they talk to the church. And the church says, yeah, we want him. So is that the open door that no man shutteth? I mean, you know, or does he go or does he stay? Well, if God didn't want me to go, he would have shut the door. That is bull. That's like a bomber saying if God doesn't want it to go off, he'll stop it. Are you kidding me? God, if God wants me to arrive safely, He won't let me fall asleep while I'm driving. Are you an idiot? <laughs> you know, th this is, this is th and this is the thing. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Well, they didn't grow up with my dad. <laughs> and he could shut the door for you. Okay. Anyway, these are just some of the ways that we do this. And they love the old put out the fleece thing. Now, God, if you want something to, if you want this to happen, I need a sign. Show me something. I saw this on a, Bill and I were streaming something on Netflix the other night, and I saw this woman that kept saying over and over, I need a sign, I need a sign. And you know, the sun was shining through the window, and it happened to be on a certain spot on the wall, and that was the sign. Give me an ever-loving break. But you know what? We're laughing about it. There are people that live their whole life this way. And you know what? You can't talk them out of it. You can't. Because the Word isn't that important to them. But, okay, never mind. Here we go. So, or, or we go to this one. Yeah, I'll get, I know how to get God's will. You know how to get God's will? I'll show you. This is one that was given to me. This is great. Give me those verses in Proverbs. I think they're next. Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. But not just written once, how about the next one? Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. And not twice, but three times. Proverbs 24, 6, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And, 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 and you know what? All that thing about deciding God's will boils down to three things. Pray, read your Bible, and do the best you can. There could be a fourth one, and get a, there's, there's safety and a multitude of counselors. Go get a multitude of counselors. And you know what they do? They go get a multitude of counselors, and they got 15 different opinions. By the way, that's not what Proverbs is talking about there. But we'll, we'll maybe get a chance to talk about that sometime. It's not talking about, go get everybody's opinion, and then God will just make sure He gives you, you know, the right one. And that pray and read your Bible and do the best you can. First, do read the Bible. If you don't know where to go in your Bible to talk about what the will of the Lord is, that becomes an awfully big book. So for me... When I was a young preacher boy, I kid you not, this is how crazy I was, I did Bible roulette. I did. And you know what? I, no, I didn't even, I wasn't that advanced. I was at the beginning, but I wasn't that advanced. I didn't let it blow open. I turned it, but I turned it not looking. And I said, you know what, God, I did, I did this. I'm confessing. If you want me to be a preacher, you need to show me. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I think it's pretty evident God wants me to be a preacher to goats. I, 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 well, you know what? I did that the first time, and it didn't land on a verse I could interpret. So I thought, 
there must have been something wrong with me. So I closed it up again. And I opened it up. I thumbed it. And you know why I turned? I remember I turned it, so I don't know. Is this, how is this thing, you know? Okay, and I just turned it, and I put my finger on it. Okay, here we go. Since the days that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build, the, to build an house that my name might be herein, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. Hey! You know, anyway, I did that three times, and none of those verses were, were working. And I thought, God doesn't want me to be a preacher. That's what I thought. I did. And so, you know what? I grumbled about it to the Lord. I really loved the Lord. I wanted to serve God. I really did. I had no knowledge, so he had no, he had no reason to use me because I was worthless like some others in here. But there, there, there are, you know, I just thought, you know, God doesn't want me. And so, and then I hear preachers say, if, if you, you know what, if you think, you can do anything other than preach, then do that. I've heard that. Hey, unfortunately, I even repeated that one time. Not out of knowledge, just because I was a dummy. I did it. And then I'd hear, hear guys say, man, God whipped me, and he whipped me, and he whipped me, and I finally surrendered to the ministry. And, I'm, and I was talking to the Lord, and I went, I am begging you to let me do this. You're not whipping me. You're not punishing me. I didn't know the doctrine. I just knew my life was pretty good. And I thought, I, I want to do this. I'll work hard. Can you, I need to know if you're doing this. And then a guy preached a message and said, if God didn't call you, he will never use you. And so I thought, that's it. That's it. So you know what? Out of rebellion one day, I told God, I'm going to do it. If you don't want to use it, that is up to you. But if there's any way a person you have rejected can be allowed to serve you, I want to do that. And so that was the premise that I started under. I don't know how many years it was before I realized none of those guys knew what they were talking about. They acted like they knew it all. They knew nothing. And it's a good thing, I guess, that the me now wasn't there then. But you know, that's ridiculous. So you know what my testimony was? I remember apologizing and saying, I don't have a great testimony, and God didn't whip me and make me do it. And I just volunteered, and I thought, eh. And then you know what? Then you come to sonship, and you know what you find out your father's looking for? Somebody that wants it. Yeah. I was ignorant of sonship, but that's where my heart was on it. So all of these things that I'm talking about are, are the things that we so goofily determine this is how we're going to know God's will there's only one way you're going to know God's will, and that's to be educated to think like your heavenly Father. You're going to think about things the way He does, and you're going to understand them from His point of view. And then you're going to look at decisions, and you're going to say, this is a good one, but that's a better one, and, but that's the best of the three. And here's why. That's what we're after here in godly judgment. And so that's what we're going to be looking at when we come back is we're going to spend this time in godly judgment. This is going to be a load of fun. Because now, not trying to scare you with it, no reason to be scared of this, but now when you learn this, you really are now becoming a threat to Satan's realm. Because a son with that kind of skill represents a real enemy. But your father is not giving him the green light yet. You have some things to learn before you get there. And my understanding is, that green light won't come on just because you read the last verses in Romans 13. You're going to have to get the doctrine out of First and Second Corinthians under your belt.
before that happens, because in 2 Corinthians, what is Paul doing? He has written 1 Corinthians to get them back on track, and once they do, he realizes they're going to come under the attack of the policy of evil and the suffering and the tribulation. So you know what he does? He educates them about the God of all comfort and how to deal with the tribulations that are now going to come their way. When you get that under your belt and you understand how to, how to deal with those attacks, that's when your father says you're ready. So we, I, I'm just saying that so you don't panic. Because I know from things I've said before, you're looking over at that verse, we're going to put on the armor of light, and you're going like, I feel like somebody's just spotting me with a spotlight, and I'm just running around defenseless. But that's not how that's going to work. Okay. All right. Uh, let's have prayer, and we'll be done. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. I am so grateful for these people. I love these folks. I'm so excited to be a part of what we're doing here. We pray, Lord, for an understanding of the doctrine that it would do that effectual work in us as what we long for, that we really would be able to have your wisdom, not just to know between the things that are good and evil, but to be able to discern about decisions that we're going to be making in our life, and we're going to carry this skill with us. This is so exciting, Father, that we're going to carry this skill with us into the heavenly places. And we're going to utilize it in the ages to come. Thank you for the grand privilege of that. And I am so glad, Lord, there's a group of folks here that are involved in this. We're going to get to spend eternity together and labor with you in what you're doing. What a privilege. In Jesus' name, amen.